Can you tell me why he chose now to send his message in, in, the, in the scape of humanity's history right now? God, look what's going on on our planet. I mean, I mean a couple things. <laughs> yeah, a couple, yeah, you're not too much. <laughs> not, <laughs> it's a very dull place. Um, <clears throat> I, I think, well, first of all, our, in, in a sense, invitation energetically to extraterrestrials by starting to explore space that we are becoming aware we're not the only planet around, probably not the only civilization. That kind of triggers a message to them energetically that we might be ready for some form of connection, some form of dialogue to see whether we want to move forward with the idea of contact or not. So that's, that's one thing. Uh, secondly, obviously, we are in need of different tools at this point. Uh, you know, in the 21st century, we have to sort of let go of a lot of outdated and old fashioned definitions and ideas. And they recognize that now is the time to introduce some new ideas and definitions. And hopefully that makes a change in our reality, or at least some people's reality to, again, sort of change our vibration and bring us closer to the possibility of making contact with them. <clears throat> so let me ask you then, because you said something that's interesting that we have to let go of old ideas, things that aren't serving us anymore. But so many of these ideas, these things that we're doing are so entrenched that it's mm -hmm. almost impossible at this point, unless there's a group collective cho choosing of, of change. Kind of like, I think when the pandemic happened, it was the first big shock to the system where now people are working from home, people are reevaluating their lives. It was that giant break that the entire planet essentially needed. It was very odd. It's never happened in human history to my understanding. Um, well, yeah, not certainly in this way. Um, but again, they, they take advantage of those kinds of things. They recognize that that, that is a psychological change, a shift <clears throat> where people start looking for different things, start opening up to different ideas. And, and so they're willing to sort of use that and see what we're willing to absorb. Um, but it doesn't have to necessarily happen all at once collectively. You know, the more individuals change themselves, then it, it over time it becomes a collective. Uh, you know, just like anything, each generation starts becoming a new collective um, with new ideas. I mean, think about it this way, really, you know, since, uh, you know, the late 60s, there has been no one born who doesn't, think we haven't been in space right so it's like you know when i was born that was not something that was true but you know now what 30 year olds 40 year olds 50 year olds have always thought that we've been in space so mm -hmm. that's a big shift in our collective consciousness and a, and an opening and like i said kind of an invitation for other beings to recognize that we may be ready for more awareness of what's in space so is because a lot of the Bashar, a lot of the uh, ideas and messages that Bashar puts out, he they are they are you know talking about space and talking about technology to a certain extent, but it's all about internal growth, internal evolution of the human soul and, and, and humanity in general. I have to ask, why do they care? <laughs> why even bother? We're savages. <laughs> Well, in some senses, without going into a deeper explanation of this story, we are family with them. Mm. So um, they see us that way. Uh, and we have actually some genetic connection to his civilization. That's a big story, a long mm. story. But they do see us as family and they are trying to help. Uh, they know what it's like to be part of a larger galactic community. They know what it can do for a civilization in terms of changing their perspective and outlook on life. And so, but again, they're not forcing us to do anything, which is why they're kind of sort of staying in the background and just delivering information in various ways, like through channels and so on and so forth, to see what we're willing to take on, what we're willing to, to grab onto. Uh, and then decide for ourselves whether we want to go farther. But from their perspective, the kind of civilization they are, 
they are passionate about helping people wake up. It, it's just the way that they're oriented because they know what it's done for them to have evolved to this point where they expand their consciousness and what's available to someone when their consciousness is open. And, you know, again, they're not forcing us to take their word for it, but they're saying, here's a toolkit. And if you apply this in your life, you'll prove to yourself that there are other ways that you can live. And maybe that will make a difference in how you experience life on your world. So it's just the way they operate. So when you said awake, and, and that's something, I mean, I have a book right behind me that says awake and awaken, and yogis have been talking about it for 5,000 years to awaken out of Maya and, and this, this illusion. And it's been many different philosophies and religions over the years. Can you explain when you say awake, is that, is that where, which a, a word that's been coined now, it's simulation theory, which is essentially Maya, which we are in an illusion. Is that what you mean by awake? You're awakening to the reality of, oh, this isn't real. We are in this different level of existence, but this is not the end all be all. Yeah, that's part of it. And um, I would say when we use the word illusion, I want to be careful because <clears throat> it's not that the experience of physical reality isn't real. Sure. The experience is very real, but we are, according to him, and like you said, many other teachers over time, we are the ones creating this illusion. It's a projection of consciousness. Right. In fact, I just saw uh, a recent article that, you know, even quantum physics is starting to catch up to the idea that, hey, all of this is just a holographic projection of some sort from somewhere. So even science is starting to talk about the ephemeral nature of physical reality. Um, and so, yeah, it's about becoming aware that, that what we experience in life is our creation and that it's determined by what we believe to be true about ourselves and what kind of process we're attempting to experience to help ourselves learn and grow. Uh, from Bashar's point of view, that's the whole point of physical reality. It's sort of like forgetting that you're an expanded being so that you can rediscover that you're an expanded being from another perspective. And that's how creation expands because the, the structure of existence, according to him, never changes. It is what it is, but your relationship to it, your experience of it, your perspective of it changes. And that's how creation grows. Um, and so the idea of going through these physical experiences, these limited experiences with the, uh, attempt or potential to break through that illusion and realize that you have created this for yourself for a specific purpose uh, really expands your consciousness, gives you a whole different perspective on life and, and just makes things um, a lot more understandable. Right. Because it seems, you know, when you don't have that kind of understanding of, of a wider consciousness, it, this all seems random and chaotic and chaos. Right crazy. Yeah. You know, but when you understand the nature of it and the structure of it and how we create it, and which is what Bashar explains a lot of, uh, then it becomes something that you can really be in the driver's seat about <clears throat> and have the experience that will still give you the lessons you want to learn and help you grow, but it doesn't have to be suffering. It doesn't have to be a struggle anymore. Uh, so this is our awakening is that we don't necessarily have to struggle. We don't have to suffer. Challenges, of course, will always come around. But from Bashar's point of view, challenges are fun. It's what helps us get a new perspective and grow. So it's not about losing the challenges, but it's about losing the suffering and the struggling uh, that we've been prone to for thousands of years because our choices have been limited because our knowledge has been limited. So they're trying to help us understand how things really work expand our knowledge of the universe and creation and reality so that we have more tools to work with so that we can be more creative people in a way that doesn't uh, make us struggle and suffer. So you mentioned that we choose our reality and we choose this projection that's in front of us. Can you kind of dig into that a little bit, explain it to people who might not understand that we are literally creating the reality that we're walking every day? Yeah, I know there's a lot of confusion in using that word and, and, you know, the language itself is very limited. So when I say, and when Bashar says we choose, it doesn't mean that we're choosing consciously. So in other words, it's not like saying, oh, you know, you consciously chose to get into an accident. 
But what he's saying is the belief systems, the definitions about yourself in relation to life that you are choosing because you've been taught to choose them, like I'm not worthy or, you know, bad things inevitably happen to me or things like that, that are sort of simmering around in the unconscious mind cause certain effects to happen. And that's what he means by we're choosing it and we're creating it. And so a big part of uh, his information is how to get in touch and become aware of the beliefs that you've bought into about yourself in relation to anything that happens so that you can have a better definition and a better relationship with that thing and use it to your advantage instead of going on automatic, so to speak, and just letting the unconscious beliefs run your life. It's becoming more aware of yourself, more awake about who you are. It kind of goes back to that old saying, know thyself and really investigate yourself to understand why do you believe what you believe about yourself? Why do you still hold on to something that maybe your parents, your schooling, your friends, your, your society taught you that isn't working for you, that isn't who you really are? So it's really about um, digging deeper in yourself, finding out what you believe to be true and understanding whether or not you wanna keep holding on to that or replace it with a definition and a belief that better suits you that will then cause a change to happen in the way you experience your life and your physical reality. But what you're suggesting is uh, for many people, scary to look in inward, to look inside, to analyze yourself. Is this, why is it scary? That's exactly. another definition. Right. That's another definition. See, we get caught up in these chains and links of definitions, right. one reinforcing the other. So we have a lot of definitions that even prevent us from finding those definitions because we're too afraid that if we go looking, what we're afraid will, will be true, will be true. And from Bashar's perspective, it's never really going to be true because, you know, we're a part of creation. We're, we're reflections of creation, God, all that is, whatever you want to call it. And, and from his point of view, creation doesn't make mistakes. So if we exist, which we do, then we're worthy of that existence. And to to believe that we're not worthy, we're not deserving, in a sense is arguing with creation. Well, Bashar says we'll never win that argument because we can never cease to exist. So you might as well take it on the fact of your existence that you are worthy of your existence and stop you know, bemoaning and berating yourself and thinking less of yourself. We are reflections of creation and, and we are here to allow creation to be all that it is. So, you know, we have to start at this very fundamental level of breaking those chains of negative definitions that keep us down. And we don't even know or are aware that we have a lot of these definitions. So finding them, bringing them to the surface, going, wait a minute, this makes no sense. It doesn't make sense in life to think this way, to believe this way, is the first step from Bashar's point of view as to how we start breaking those chains and freeing ourselves to realize we can choose the definitions that work for us because we are each unique. We have a different perspective from anyone else. <clears throat> we are a unique part of creation and we deserve to express our full selves in life. So is that what's is that what is happening right now in society in general? I feel that 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 there's a lot of stuff that was under the surface is bubbled up, and that's why there's so much more everything. I mean, between war and and violence and politics and economy, yeah. all is that what's happening in in yeah. humanity right now? He said that very very because people say you know why is it so crazy right now, and he's saying well you know <clears throat> you've been doing this cycle of negativity for thousands of years you're kind of at the end and you're about to shift into something different. But in order to do so, you kind of have to get everything out on the table. All of the negativity, all of the positivity, every choice that could possibly be made, you're now sort of seeing in one place. So it's giving us an opportunity to go, do we want to continue this way? I mean, look how strong the reflections are of you know things that are going on now like you're saying, you know, war and racism and all this stuff is just really bubbling to the surface because it's about time for us to face all these issues and really make choices about what kind of world we want to have. So <clears throat> it's a little more complex than that, but Bashar is basically saying like, here's your opportunity. It's only going to, you know, probably be available for a while. 
And some people are going to make certain choices that take them in one way, and other people are going to make choices that take them in another direction. And what he's saying is, you know, this, this goes into the whole idea of parallel realities, because he's saying everything exists all at once. You know, time is an illusion. And there are different versions of Earth that exist right now. And the idea is not that we change the world we're on, but that we change our vibration and it navigates us in the direction of a parallel version of Earth that's already more reflective of what we prefer or what we don't. So right now it's like a melting pot of ideas. Here's negativity, here's positivity, here's neutrality. Here's all these things we could choose. What do you wanna choose? So when people start choosing one thing over another, even individually and collectively, they start going that way. And eventually he's saying in, in the years to come, you know, the more people that choose a particular direction will actually sort of create a crystallization of that um, perspective for themselves and will no longer be able to even experience people with a different idea. So he's saying this is called the splitting prism from his perspective. And it's like, we're literally in a, a train station and we're deciding what train and what track we're going to be on. But eventually whatever train you board is going to be the only train that you can go on to because now all the tracks are going away in different directions. And once you're too far away on your direction, it's going to be even harder to go and decide, oh, I want to be on that other train because now it's like hundreds of miles away. So this is the time of choice. This is the time of choosing what reality we want and what we will inevitably experience while other people will experience other kinds of realities completely different than ours, but they'll experience that in a different parallel reality. To watch the full video, click on the link below and don't forget to subscribe.